it's very much my really distinct pleasure and honor to um, introduce to you uh, Dr. Seema Lani, who is going to be our speaker today. Um, so Dr. Lalani is a professor in the Department of Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, she did her medical degree at Aga Khan University in Pakistan, and then did her residence in pediatrics at Hershey Medical Center in Pennsylvania, followed by a fellowship in clinical genetics at Baylor, where she then stayed on um, and has been since. So she's board certified in uh, pediatrics, but also clinical genetics, clinical cytogenetics, and molecular genetics. Um, and throughout the course of her medical and um, clinical career, she has always been interested in sort of elucidating and understanding the sort of genetic basis, particularly of congenital diseases. Um, so this goes as far back to some of the early descriptions of uh, Chard syndrome, and you'll see her name against the gene reviews for Chard syndrome, um, but also includes a number of microdeletion and microduplication syndromes, um, as well as more recently uh, defects in uh, Tango 2 and Tango 2 deficiency disorder, for which she is a member of the Tango 2 Research Foundation. Um, she's also been involved in the Undiagnosis Disease Network site at Baylor College of Medicine, um, through which her sort of interests and uh, descriptions of again, genotype, phenotype correlations and diseases has uh, expanded. But on top of that, more recently, um, she's been able to uh, leverage some of her interests in sort of advancing some of these scientific advance, taking some of these scientific advancements to advance sort of community education and patient advocacy. She's done this in a number of different um groups, including some of the Vietnamese groups as it relates to things like uh, speech delays. Um, and then in 2022, uh, this sort of culminated in a grant from NCATS to collaborate with the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley um, in South Texas to um, really sort of serve the uh, Hispanic community in that area as far as sort of, imp uh, sort of implementing clinical genetics and clinical genomics. Um, and that's going to be the bulk of what she'll talk about today. Um, and I thought that fit very well with some of the interests and impetus of the Center for Precision Health Research, not just to think about sort of uh, diagnoses or on the sort of translational side, but really to think about implementation, um, how we actually help the patients and go to the patients, uh, go to all patients. Um, and I thought this would be an, a fantastic example to share with the group. On a personal level, um, you know, Seema was my attending for many years when I was at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, she taught me not only a lot of my clinical genetics, but a lot of my cytogenetics as well. Um, and then over the years, she has been a tremendous mentor, a colleague, and a friend. Um, and so it really is my pleasure to uh, have her agree to give this talk um, and to give us the opportunity to do this. Um, so with that, I'm going to leave it to Dr. Lalani to tell you all the rest, and then we'll take questions at the end. Thank you, Neil. That was great. <laughs> A lovely introduction. Um, and, you know, I am always happy to talk about Project Give. It's it's close to my heart. And, uh, you know, this it began as work, but it quickly developed into a passion. So thank you for inviting me. Um, so let's get into this uh, uh, right away. So this is where I work. It's Rio Grande Valley, or also called RGV. Uh, so RGV uh, is at the southernmost tip of Texas. As you can see, the red color here, a maroon color, uh, indicates the enrichment of Hispanic population in this area. And you can see that this border region uh, is particularly uh, rich in Hispanic community. So Rio Grande Valley is has a population of just over a million residents. 94% of this population is Hispanic. Uh, one third is... Uh, uh, so not, I don't know if we're seeing your slides. At least we're not online. Oh, you're not? No, we're, we're not online. I don't know if they're seeing it in the room. Let me do stop share and start share again. Yeah. Like that. Ah, uh -huh. that's, there's a trick, great. Works? Okay. Yep. All right. All right. So you haven't missed much. So this is my first slide. So, so 
let me know if you have trouble uh, seeing the rest of the slides. So this is the, the red color, maroon color that indicates the, the Hispanic population along the Texas-Mexico border. So RGV has, uh, as I was saying, population of over a million residents. One third is uninsured. About one third of people live in poverty in the four counties that make up uh, Rio Grande Valley. And according to Texas Bird Defects Registry, uh, there is a higher prevalence of bird defects in this region compared to other counties. So estimated to be around just over 400 cases per 10,000 live birds. And this is much higher than other surrounding counties in Texas. So there are several barriers to receiving genomic care in this region. And just to confirm, Neil, you are seeing the slide. Yes, seeing it okay. looks good. Okay. So um, this region has traditionally had scarcity of geneticists. Uh, there is limited ability to travel for access to services. So just to give you an example, um, in the bottom part here where McAllen, uh, you can see, so that's part of the Rio Grande Valley, one of the cities. And families here um, either had to travel uh, all the way to Corpus Christi, which is about close to 150 miles to get genomic services or travel to Houston, which is upwards of 300 miles or go to San Antonio. So it, it's really difficult for these families traditionally to get genomic services that they need. And some of these families are undocumented, so that makes it much, much harder to access services. Uh, we talked about lack of insurance. Language is a barrier. Up to 40% of families we serve in this region only speak Spanish. So that that is a factor in accessing a genomic service. And then uh, there is limited familiarity among clinicians in this region uh, to recognize um, genetic disorders and when to send these uh, children uh, our way. So several barriers. Um, and I don't have to tell you this, but we all know that access to genetic testing and services is not equitable, especially among the ethnic minorities. And among these ethnic groups, Hispanic Americans may be the least likely to receive genetic testing. I also wanted to introduce the people of Rio Grande Valley here. Um, so it is urbanized. So uh, it has some large cities like uh, McAllen, Edinburgh, Brownsville, uh, Harlingen. Um, and you also see that there is these poor housing, especially at the border regions. They are called colonias. And these housing structure typically lack running water, electricity, sewage, plumbing. So you you wonder where people and children in from these housing are going for their genomic care. The people are very friendly. It's been a pleasure working with these families and you see the passion that they have in, in, in bringing about a change in the region. And so I think that's that was a valuable lesson for me, knowing these families that they've been working to improve things for a very long time before we got there in 2022. The area is rich in culture, rich in food, um, and, you know, the food is always one of the reasons why we make our trip so amongst just meeting with our partners, but excellent food. So, um, you know, if you have not come to this region, um, maybe worthwhile to make a trip at some point. Reducing health disparities, why is it important, right? And again, I don't have to uh, uh, talk more about it uh, with this audience, but I just highlighted some of the points in red. So. Without a diagnosis, these children may endure years of health decline and we would not benefit from broadly available treatment options that is present everywhere else. Uh, and they may not get opportunities to get into clinical trials to modulate the disease course. And we've seen again and again that there is recurrence of sometimes very severe diseases in this population because parents are unaware of their inherent genetic makeup. So we were fortunate to um, get funding from NCATS for Project GIVE. It's an acronym uh, for Genetic Inclusion by Virtual Evaluation. For this 
project, we partnered with the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, UTRGV. Uh, and it began in early part of 2022. We just finished the first phase, the UG3 phase in uh, in January of 2024. And most of the data I'll show you is coming uh, from, from this phase of the study. So um, our specific aims going in were to reduce time to diagnosis by using a machine assisted virtual web-based service. And I'll talk more about that. Uh, and the point is to deliver state-of-the-art genetic evaluation in this medically underserved population. We wanted to provide genetic diagnosis through whole genome sequencing for medical decision-making, and our target recruitment was 100 children over two years. We also felt that it was equally important to build genomic competency of the frontline providers through education and using AI tools such as face to gene to expedite referral of uh, the patients they were seeing to Project Give. So yes, we had these very high goals. <laughs> we wanted to make all these changes. The cha challenges were very obvious going in. So how do we simplify patient pathway for this medically underserved region that has traditionally seen very few geneticists uh, that have been accessible? And how do we improve access to care and reduce the time to diagnosis with the existing barriers that we just saw? Uh, and then what was the best way to educate the healthcare providers in recognizing genetic diseases and referring them as soon as possible? So the first thing first, we said we need to find a partner first, a major partner that will allow us to begin this work. So we decided to partner with UTRGV now, this is a very young institution. It was created by Texas legislature in 2013. They started medical school in 2015. Um, and we were very fortunate to have the leadership of Dr. Robert Nelson, who was the chairman of pediatrics department uh, at that time when it began this work. And he understood the need of the community and the potential of bringing genomic sequencing to this region. And with his blessing, we began this work. Uh, we also were provided our study site by UTRGV. And this is um, a multi-specialty clinic under UTRGV in Edinburgh, Texas. And the beauty of this site was that it not just had the pediatricians on site, but it also had some of the subspecialty services such as a developmental pediatrician, neurologist, and a very experienced pulmonologist. So we knew that if we were looking for patients, at least we can start from, from this clinic and we can work with uh, these partners to see if they are seeing children with genetic problems who can be referred to Project Give. So now we have a site. Now the thing is, how do we bring in patients, right? So what do we do next uh, to improve access to care? And for that, we wanted to leverage a, a virtual platform that we had been working on since 2016, and it's called Consultagene. So um, it's www.consultagene.org. We started under the leadership of Brendan Lee to develop this virtual platform between 2016 and 2018. And it is a HIPAA compliant online multimedia platform that has a bunch of educational videos uh, within the portal, which were also uh, internally designed. It allows genetic counseling. This portal allows telehealth services. And it was uh, formally launched in 2021. So since 2021, Consulta Gene Clinic has been providing services um, in the area of prenatal, preconception, cancer, and neurology care. And it's a telehealth evaluation of patients but it had not been used for pediatric evaluation. Uh, and so uh, when we put together the project give application, I, I said that I will use Consultagene platform for evaluation of, uh, um, of children. Um, so this was something unique that had not been done. I wanted to also show you some of the educational aspect of Consultagene. So these are almost 20 videos 
And uh, the first two are the ones that I've used for my patients, which is what to expect at a genetics appointment and the basics of genetics. Many of these videos have been translated into Spanish and other languages. Um, and let's let's talk about how how a doctor or let's say from this specialty clinic would log on to consult the gene and start referring patients. So the model was that they would log on to www.consultagene.org and ask for a peer-to-peer -peer consultation, which will then take them to establish an account uh, as a licensed healthcare provider. Uh, a username and password will be generated. And once they are in the portal, uh, they have the all they have to do is just start referring patients. So it could be very basic demographic information about the patient they are seeing, name, uh, date of birth, gender. And we ask them if they could upload at least one note, uh, either from their clinic or if the child was already seen by a geneticist or other subspecialty service, so that we have an idea of the needs of this child and if this child would benefit from whole genome sequencing. So again, you know, we going in, we had no idea that you are, even at this point, we were asking too much of our pediatricians because they are extremely busy. And we were thinking that they would be uploading just like UDN style, like, you know, uh, a note from ophthalmology, a note from neurology. It's, it wasn't going to happen. So most of the time we end up with a very brief description of what the needs are of the child. Sometimes it's just few lines and we've, we've learned to work with that. Sometimes it's even like a three year old with seizures and that's all we're gonna get. Um, and so it's been a, a learning process and despite these challenges, how to get these patients in, uh, that has been the key. Uh, when we went in, we wanted to open it up to not just the physicians, the MDs uh, in this clinic, but we said, what about the medical assistant who's seeing these patients come in and out of the clinic? And could she not refer a patient who is coming in a wheelchair, for example, to see a pulmonologist and maybe has muscular dystrophy? So we opened it up so that, you know, anybody could just log on to consultagene.org, at least from this clinical practice to start with and start uh, to refer these patients. This is, I wanted to show you what the portal looks like from the clinician side uh, who is referring. So they would have all these patients uh, that they have referred and they can go back and forth and see if there has been some communication from the project gift team because they would get an alert every time we upload a note, for example, for the referring physician to see, they would get that notification to go back and check. Uh, this is their dashboard. So it allows them to message us. It allows them to schedule consultation through Acuity. Um, it has the videos that I already talked about that they could go back and look at at their own convenience. It has multiple other resources. Um, so this is what it looks like on their end. And when uh, we get these referrals, this is what it looks like on our end. So we would get the patient information <clears throat> and then uh, this would be our dashboard. So for example, the top one is a patient that has come from Dr. Gomez, uh, who's an endocrinologist and you can see so on. So then all these patients are in the portal and, our and next is a decision to accept these patients or not. So, um, and then I wanted to show you just one other part of consulta gene that once we have seen the patient and had an encounter with them, we can complete our entire note, which is just the same as if we are seeing a patient uh, at Texas Children's Hospital and we upload it for the physician uh, or the referring person to see. So the communication is, is always there. So now we have the place to start the work in. We have a product that we believe will improve access to care. Now, how to bring patients in. So we, this is Roberta Sierra. She is our research coordinator for this region and she is native to Edinburgh, Texas. She is a social worker in elementary school, knows these families very, very well. And so we were so blessed that we got her in the study because 
she, knowing the Hispanic community, she guided us at very crucial points in our study. So for example, um, she directed us to go outside UTRGV to partner with other people. And Easter Seals is something that uh, has been our, our great referrer. So these are early childhood intervention therapists who see children from zero to three years of age and they are going door to door and seeing these patients with global delay or seizures and a lot of those things. And they had no way to send these patients to geneticists before. So we we talked about Project Gift to them. We told them how to start referring these patients and it, it was a game changer. Um, then again, with Roberta's help, we found out that we had to go to this outpatient pediatric rehabilitation center in the region and we went there and these are children and these children are getting served in this in this big rehab center and they have very complex needs and and we would just go and sit there and you know five out of 10 children appeared to have genetic conditions just by looking at them and you know maybe they had a diagnosis and most of them did not and so we we mentioned we talked about project give to the leadership and you know we've been um We've been getting referrals from from this facility as well. So just building a wider community partnership. We also went to the competitors, for example, of the RGV. Um, and DHR Health is one of that health system. And we found out that these two endocrinologists were seeing a lot of patients. And sort of these patients possibly had genetic disorders too, like short stature, tall stature multiple endocrine abnormalities and they were they were able to do some panel testing uh sponsored panel testing and so we knew that there was a need there and and we just partnered with them and they have been one of the top referrers again uh to project give so just expanding continuing to expand more and more there were always community pediatricians we relied on and then I wondered where these children with sensory neural hearing loss were going. So who was doing genetic testing on them and uh, partnered with uh, the audiologist, the ENT physician, so that we could get those referrals as well. And finally, these are some of the other partners that we um, we approached and we talked about Project Give uh, and went to this Vanny Cook Children's Cancer Center and, and you know, try to say that please send your children with multiple congenital anomalies and cancer to us, children with family history of multiple cancers to us. And then again, Roberta taught us that this is the way to do it. Food is an important part of Hispanic culture. So um, you meet with them, but you also uh, show how much you care and sh about, about the project and about the population and you share your meals with them. And it's it's a great way to build these partnerships. And I'm really glad that we learned that very early on. And then, you know, talking about uh, those CME lectures, CEU lectures, that was an essential part of our, of our project going in. So um, this is something which is very unique. This is a public library, which has a beautiful auditorium. Uh, which we used to bring clinicians in from the Valley. And uh, we gave two CEU seminars in two years and talked about, you know, why we are here, why Rio Grande Valley, what is, what are genetic disorders and how to identify genetic disorders. We talked about using face to gene to see what they can do on, on their end to find these patients and refer them. Um, and we also learned that it wasn't, easy to just say that send patients who have suspected genetic disorders. I think we need to be very specific about this ask when we are approaching these unique communities because we have to specify exactly what constitutes a likely genetic disorder. So uh, we had this, this one um, page uh, sheet that we also distributed uh, to the community pediatricians, talked about this in our CME lectures, you know, send us children with intellectual disability or epilepsy or congenital heart disease with extra cardiac anomalies, uh, children with hearing loss, um, uh, obesity with an intellectual disability. So we had to put it down for them to start finding these patients for us. And yes, going back, so Project Give is, is based on outpatient evaluation and 
being a geneticist, I know how inpatient side is perhaps as important or more important to be seen. Um, but for various reasons, we, 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 we thought that our workflow would work better if these patients come to us after getting discharged. So we have seen children uh, with microphthalmia, for example, babies with microphthalmia coming out of NICU and straight to us. We've seen a family with congenital hypotonia again coming out of NICU into Project GIVE. And uh, we found a diagnosis of uh, uh, myotonic dystrophy in the family. So it's 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 worked very well, even for those very early presentations. Um, and we've been able to get them in fast. So you saw all our other partners that have helped us get these patients. Um, we also partnered with Texas Birth Defects Registry, which is one of the largest population birth defects, uh, birth defect surveillance system. Uh, and very um, um, uh, detailed characterization of these patients with birth defects in this region. And I was fortunate to get into the state IRB to be able to uh, benefit from this registry. Uh, we've used it, but I think there's always potential to use it more for, for Project Give. So this is our team. Uh, so the top one are the pediatricians from UTRGV who helped us uh, either they would refer patients or they would sit in our weekly meetings to try and find the patients who would best benefit from, from whole genome sequencing. Um, so I have my uh, genetic counselor, Blake, who's been exceptionally helpful in uh, working uh, with these families. And uh, Dr. Claudia Soler is another geneticist who's Spanish speaking, who's helped me I, I recruited a, a res pediatric resident and Spanish speaker who also love to participate in Project Give activities. And these are our consultant gene site administrator and developer. And of course, Roberta, um, she's she's Baylor employed um, and she we couldn't do this work without her. So this is how once we decide that these patients would benefit from the study and we've been able to accept 80% of these referrals that have come in. So, um, so Roberta waits for these families and they come um, at the study site. Uh, they see the educational videos. Um, they complete the baseline CSER survey, which gives us demographic information. Uh, and then uh, Blake and I log on and we do our HNP and the remote evaluation. Remote physical evaluation is challenging, but we do our best. Um, we, we rely on um, detailed photographs that Roberta takes for us. We use pace to gene very often in this community to help us uh, make the um, at least make some diagnosis clinically before WGS results. Um, after we complete visit one, we send a detailed note via consulted gene to our um, to our clinicians. Uh, we see these patients for visit two uh, after the WGS results are back. It used to take two to three months, but now it's taking three weeks for these results to come back. And we, if we have a diagnosis, we provide a detailed account of what this diagnosis means, what are the management guidelines, and Blake would translate it into Spanish whenever needed. Um, so clear communication with the families, with with the people who are sending these kids our way, it's it's extremely important. And then we also follow these patients uh, for visit three, uh, which is six months after visit two, to see how how they are doing, uh, what if the management guidelines were placed, if they've been followed, or if they have any questions. And at various points, we do the CSER survey uh, to assess the study outcomes. So um, just wanted to give you some um, information, just general information about the community partners we engaged. So we have had over the two years about 21 community partners, um, and we've received over 200 referrals through Consultagene. And Dr. Gomez is our endocrinologist, as I said. He, he sends a lot of patients and Easter seals as well. So once we find a diagnosis for these patients, we've seen that they send more and more. So it's it's been great uh, to serve serve these um, serve this population. In terms of the specialty, again, endocrinologists 
and the pediatricians and our therapists have been our top three uh, specialties that have been sending uh, Project Give patients. And of course, we are getting more and more patients with sensory neural hearing loss from this region uh, to evaluate. This is an important slide, I feel, and I wanted to just mention here that um, this is a figure which tells us the number of referrals by month. And you can see within this up and down, it the up and down, this coincides with our visits to this region. So in blue is our on in-person visit to this, to this region. And the green ones are the two CME events we held in this region in person. So you can see that this is absolutely essential to keep this community engaged. So you show up and the numbers go up. And this is what they see that, that you are dedicated to, to work with the, these families and, and it shows. So it, it never stops. We Even if it's a virtual project, we have to make sure that we make our a time to time visits uh, in this region and continue our engagement. So to give you some of the final numbers we have so far. So uh, as I said, we were funded to recruit 100 patients and we and we received 246 referrals through consult gene, um, clearly surpassing our, our target. 81% of them were accepted in the study. Uh, 145 families have been enrolled. There was some drop off here because again, a unique thing to this population is they move a lot. So even if they are accepted, our research coordinator is sometimes unable to find them and bring them into Project Give. So we do lose some of our families that way. Uh, out of 145 families enrolled, 91 have completed visit one and 78 families uh, have received their whole genome sequencing results. So we have results on 28 families with overall diagnostic yield of about 36%. And of course, it doesn't include uh, the partially solved uh, patients as well as those that are probably going towards a uh, new gene discovery. So those stories are different, um, but 36% just on the salt only cases. We did find one child who was two years old, developmentally delayed, was found to have Brugada syndrome with SCN5A mutation, and she was asymptomatic. And we did end up sending her to Houston, which is like five hours away. Of for, for the care that she needed. So uh, some demographic information about these families we have in our study, 98% Hispanic, and you can see the annual household income. So most of them come from low socioeconomic background. 39% of our families are Spanish speaking only, but 60% we are able to uh, have, uh, you know, use our language, uh, English, to, to take care of them. Um, and this is the highest grade or level of education. And you can see that many of these families fall from less than high school, less than ninth grade to associate college degree level. But we do have families who have bachelor's and uh, professional degrees as well. So now I just wanted to give you some examples of the rare diseases we've seen in this region. So QARS1, very rare disease. We, we saw this in this child who has had epilepsy since birth. He's 10 or 11 years old now, and he's never had a diagnosis. He is very delayed. And again, although we couldn't do much in terms of medical management, but the mom was very... Uh, happy to get these results that finally, after so many years, he has a diagnosis. And again, just to give you one example of how this patient came. So we just got a referral for this patient that he he had he had seizure disorder, not knowing the severity of it. And he, he came in ambulance. And so we have sometimes no idea what we're going to see. Um, he came with the nurse. So, you know, it can be a child who has a lot of needs, or it can be a child who may not have that many needs. But but we take these patients with minimal information at times, often just relying on how many subspecialty services these kids are seeing, and then just making our decision based on that. This is a patient, uh, CYP27B1 uh, biallelic mutation. 
he came to us with developmental delay and he had vitamin D dependent rickets and he's responding very well to calcitriol. So some, some um, great examples of how medical management has come out of these diagnoses. And then again, um, stating the same, like not having expectation that if I find a brain malformation uh, disease in this child, uh, I will have necessarily the MRI uh, to look at. So we we go in thinking that maybe, you know, you know, this kid has spastic tetraplegia and should have had MRI, but may never have had MRI. And here he has a diagnosis, which should cause uh, some abnormality in his brain. Um, STRC. So we've yeah. seen a number of patients with hearing loss. Um, none of them have so far had Connexin 26 mutation, and they have different kinds of reasons for their hearing loss. Um, and again, uh, saying more about phase two gene because we've used that in some of our patients, and this is one patient with cancer one who actually was picked up by phase two gene. So we have. Other, one more child with Kuhlen de Rye syndrome. Uh, and, you know, clinically, it's hard for me to diagnose them, but I, I really uh, take help from phase two gene. This is a patient here who has two diagnoses. So, NR2F2 related Schoen's complex and ACAN mutation. So, NR2F2 was de novo, but ACAN mutation was present in her mom. And so, this population who has short stature, they probably don't think too much about it, but this was a re, uh, ACAN related short stature in the family with advanced bone age. Um, and yeah, we've seen some uh, more relatively common disorders such as uh, FGFR3 related hypochondroplasia. And again, father carried it and he said, I'm 30 years old and I'm getting this diagnosis now. So, uh, a lot we have learned by working in this community. So uh, we, as I said, we use Caesar surveys to look at the outcome uh, of of these efforts. And so some of the questions I've I've uh, highlighted here, like how relieved did you feel about your child's results? And you can see that many of them felt relieved after getting either a negative WGS result or a diagnostic result. How well do you understand your child's uh, test results? So uh, we were very happy to know that these families are able to understand most of the time these complex diagnoses uh, at times. And, and you know, Blake does a wonderful job and uh, it just and she just brings it down to their level so that they can understand it better, and especially with the documentation that goes out to these families. They can hold on to it and then, you know, take it to their physicians to know what the child's diagnosis is. And overwhelmingly, they said that these results will help the child's doctor to improve the child's health. So this was very satisfying to see that this is how they, the family's perceived project give. I was treated with sensitivity and respect uh, and I felt listened to. So again, these results, um, are very encouraging uh, for us that what we are doing is helping these families. So some of the quotes from uh, parents and uh, some of these I will read, some you can uh, read on your own. Project Give has given us the hope we lost for over 12 months since finding out our results. We have started treatment, created a health plan to promote the growth and development he lost. Uh, I'm so thankful to Project Give. Always blame myself for my son's deafness. Project Give explained that my son was affected by OTOF. My husband and I are both carriers, which explains my son's deafness. No words can explain how I felt that day. So I now have a sense of relief of the cause of my son's deafness. And again, parents talk about peace of mind and finally receiving a diagnosis after years of trying to find an answer and just being very grateful. Um, so what factors have played a role in the success of Project Give? So I would say there are a few things that we can all learn from. I feel that this simple machine-assisted tool for patient referral is a key. And now our referrals tell us that it takes them two minutes to refer a patient. So 
<laughs> excuse me so that was the plan that just simplify it you don't have to upload tons and tons of records for us to to take these patients we've learned how to work with the most minimal information and in making our decisions uh, having a bilingual genetic navigator on site is an absolute must. I think finding a person local to the community who knows these families well, who has a great interaction with, with these families and who can guide the investigators on what to do and what not to do and what would work, I think it's absolutely a key. And then building strong relationship with the community partners. I showed you how in-person visits help and showing up is so important Promoting the study, so we've taken every opportunity, whether it's grand rounds at UTRGV or pediatric faculty meetings in the area, or just having teaching sessions with our Easter Seals therapists, telling them, and these these would make should make you think of a genetic disorder, and then you know when they are sending um, autism for a long time, we would just go back to them and we say, let's just. Can you find children who have autism plus intellectual disability or plus something else that will tell us that, you know, there would be a higher chance of finding something? So we've done back and forth a lot. Uh, and it's it's great to acknowledge the good work that they are doing. And again, coming back to treating them with respect, humility and appreciation because they've been there much, much longer and they've been trying to do um, a similar level of work in improving the health of these patients for a very long time. So, you know, just be cognizant of that. And, uh, you know, I always say that uh, I was told by the pulmonologist at UTRGV, it works both ways. So just make sure that, yes, we are going in to do this NIH work, but the families need to benefit from it. It has to work both ways. The engagement has to be continuous and, you know, uh, with existing partners, plus searching for new partners uh, who can uh, continue to bring in new patients and knowing when to pivot, right? So we went in thinking that this would be a complete peer-to-peer -peer model system where, you know, the clinicians would be present when we are doing a virtual evaluation, but that wasn't going to happen because these people are very busy. And so we, we had to pivot and we had to change our a workflow that you know we were doing this evaluation in the absence of uh, of the referring person, and then communication is the key with these uh, with these uh, people. And then challenges, of course, I talked about the limited clinical data that are usually available to us as we accept these patients, and they may not have received clinical investigations like echocardiogram, MRI, or eye exam for us to have that deep phenotypic information before we say, yes, we'll accept you. Uh, obtaining electronic health records is a significant challenge. And we talked about busy pediatricians. They are seeing anywhere from 50 to 100 children a day. And to ask them to refer these patients can be very challenging. So we have relied on their medical assistants, their, you know, the front desk people to, to, to refer these patients on behalf of, of the physician. And when to refer remains a work in progress. So future directions, I uh, we are very fortunate uh, and grateful that we were funded the uh, the UH three phase of the study. So now we are going to take project give to El Paso, so all the way to West Texas, and are already looking forward to that. And we are going to recruit hundred more patients during this phase of the study. We'll continue recruiting uh, in the valley as well. One one thing which I really like is that Project Give has provided opportunities for patients in the valley to get into the UDN study. So our patients who are clearly have something and their WGS comes back negative, we've taken them to UDN and uh, about eight to nine of them were accepted in the study over last year. And we also wrote a special supplement, UDN supplement uh, to recruit patients from this region. So not just patients from Project Give, but also from El Paso who could benefit. So that's that's been great that we were able to do that. Currently we have an uh, ongoing qualitative study that Blake is leading the genetic counselor to explore the barriers and facilitators for these families to access care for children with uh, genetic disorders. 
So uh, we'll have more information on that. I think it's equally important. So uh, in summary, I would say Project Give has allowed advanced genetic evaluation and delivery of genetic services uh, and, um, and has pro increased access to care for children with rare diseases uh, at the border area. And it has demonstrated how a virtual portal can be used with community engagement to circumvent the recognized barriers in this predominantly Hispanic community. And I really feel that these efforts can potentially be replicated in other medically underserved region uh, that similarly have limited resources. So with that, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge Blake and Roberta and all the people on this list who have helped us get Project Give started. We are grateful to all our referring clinicians and study participants, and of course, NCATS for uh, funding this study. So yeah, with that, I am happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Seema. That was that was fantastic. Really appreciated it. Um, and uh, to start off, we have a question from uh, Dr. Collins in the chat. It says, uh, perhaps I missed it, but how much trouble have you had with VUS findings in children with even an obvious syndromic presentation among this group? Yes. Yeah, so. I would say that we haven't had too much trouble because what we do is we do uh, have we heavily rely on uh, KFM testing the, uh, of the family members, and I think that has helped us resolve a bunch of them. I know we had somebody who was thought to have Kabuki with the VUS, but then the unaffected family members had it, so we resolved that. So we do rely on family testing. Um, and you know, I've also looked at what is the landscape of these variants, right? How different they are from other uh, other populations. And I just have some extra slides, and I will just spend a little bit time to so some of these patients who got diagnoses, and we were able to go back and look at their um, for this talk. I I said let's let's tease out like what is the landscape of these VUSs. So um, this was a VUS with the QARS one patient not present in NOMAD with a high CAT score. So never seen before. Uh, and uh, and then uh, this one was a VUS for a kid who was diagnosed with Seckle syndrome. Um, it was seen in NOMAD, uh, but it was seen on all different kinds of population. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I've tried to sort of tease that too, but it will take us more time. I think when we have more data to really uh, say how unique these VUSs are in this population. Thanks. Um, so I, I guess it's also, if, if people want to come up to the microphone and offer their questions, that is um, also a possibility. Um, so Dr. Bisco has dropped a question in, in the Q&A uh, I don't know if you want to read it, let's say you want me to read it. Uh, yeah, I can read it. Uh, oh, no. We have less in the room, so you could read it, but I, I'm happy to read it as well. Go ahead. Uh, just go ahead. Fine. Yeah. Okay, so uh, he says, lovely talk, thank you. I assume that the clinical genomic sequencing was paid for by the grant. So how are you planning to extend the access to the clinical genome testing going forward if after the grant or or how would this be extended to um, maybe areas where that's not going to be uh, easily fulfilled? Exactly. Yes. So that sustainability is always on my mind. Um, I would say that this project has some levels, right? We went in, people didn't know what WGS was, they didn't know what genetic testing was going to do, and now sort of they have a taste of it. Like this is this is really helping them. And I think that was the first thing that I wanted to make sure that happened. They're sending more patients, they want more answers, and now there's a need that has developed, which probably wasn't before. So now my second thing is to, to get help from from our uh, genetic counselors who are helping us run our clinics to partner with some of these folks and say, okay, how can we help you get the genetic testing that you want 
using your resources, uh, using Medicaid, using the insurance that your child has. So that is something that I am going to focus on in the next three years because this this is a must. It needs to continue, needs to keep going. The momentum cannot stop. Yeah, I suspect that will be partly where some of the challenges are in sort of rolling these things out. Other questions or comments in the room or? Uh, Les has a sort of follow-up question as to whether Texas Medicaid will pay for a clinical genome. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have been successful in getting that uh, at Texas Children's Hospital. We have a very high number of patients uh, on Medicaid and we've been able to do that. So that's the, the reason, like if we are successful, then we should be able to help these folks as well. Yeah, although I know that may not be the case in all the states, right? And so right. I think everyone's gonna have to navigate that challenge at some point in time. Other questions, comments or input? So so I put one in the chat because I couldn't put in the QA. So is there any other, is any family that's more than one children that was uh, need to be checked for genetic disease or is it very rare that's basically you only have one uh, children from one family? Yes, so we do have several families in which two kids are affected, yes. So we have seen that um, and we could, so the workflow is that we will take the most severely affected patient, and when we find the diagnosis, then we test the siblings, uh, and that has worked for us because it it is costly, right? So a uh, trio whole genome sequencing cost us almost three thousand dollar per family, paid for by the grant. Um, and then next question: Are participants in give able to refer other families in the community and use the give services? Excellent question. Do you see more acceptance of genetic testing in the community given the success of? So I would say I don't have data to prove it, but I would say yes, because these families uh, with one success, for example, from uh, the milestone therapeutics that, and that family seeing other families in that rehab center would say, hey, you know, I got my diagnosis from Project Give. Why don't you uh, think about it too. And then the therapist would then uh, refer that other family. So it has happened multiple times now, and uh, we are very grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you. Because I feel some community, if they are more close together, and then actually the community, the commu conversation among the community member may be more, you know, like uh, have people to realize they can use that resources. Thank you so yeah. much. Absolutely, yes, thanks. So we have one uh, question in the room. Um, so I think you can go ahead. Hi, um, I have a question, but I was wondering if you could please help me go back to the slide that I'm referring to. Uh -huh. um, it is the slide that was identifying which types of uh, specialists uh, utilize the services or yes. me the refer. Yes. This one? Okay, thank you. Yes, this is the one. And so um, just a low level question, but I was just wondering, um, when I saw medical assistant there, I was wondering if you also had um, maybe um, a different way to keep track of which um, providers offices these medical assistants were referring from, because I'm just wondering if maybe your numbers um, are um, maybe not as accurate, or maybe there's some double reporting in this uh, presentation since they would be, you know, filling that out based on what a provider has instructed them to. So yes, so I can answer that. So fortunately, I know this one because, you know, we are, we still have a grip of the numbers <laughs> we have. When it be gets bigger, then it's going to get out of hand and definitely. So this medical assistant is particularly at UTRGV. And uh, she, uh, she enters patients on behalf of the pulmonologist who is very senior and he doesn't know that, you know, the, the intricacies of entering uh, his patients. So she helps him. So she is helping multiple other people in that UTRGV specialty clinic to enter the patients. So, yeah, but you're right. I need to keep a track of that because it could be more than one medical assistant and it would get crazy then. Yes. 
Thank you. So they account for the technological challenge. Um, there's also a, a question here from Peyton Swanson. Uh, it says, well, it sounds like many of the areas you describe are somewhat urbanized. Are you able also to include patients that are from uh, the more rural areas? And so, do you, or, and or do you have an estimate for sort of what the breakdown is in terms of urban versus rural? That's, again, an excellent question and something we need to address because these colonias are a are, uh, little bit far, closer to the border. Um, and we've tried one or two times to find a site where we could see these patients. Um, but it's just too far away. And the way those clinics, they are part of UTRGV, so they are called AHAC clinics. Um, but finding a space is a challenge where these patients can have privacy and be uh, be seen. So that is a challenge. And and you're absolutely right. We are in Edinburgh, McAllen Mission area, but we have Brownsville, which is a little bit far. We have Harlingen, which is like 45 minutes away. So some families can travel from, from those areas. Brownsville is about an hour, um, but it would be great if we had a second site closer to those regions. So we will, we hopefully we will have more help from the leadership from UTRGV to make that happen. Um, and then uh, let's also have a sort of follow up question, which is more on the genetic side, which is more a sort of, you know, how, how different is it some of the genetics that you're finding? So are there founder variants in these populations? Are there a sort of unique um, carrier, you know, high, very high carrier rates for a particular variant, for instance, you know, like you see with some of the metabolic disorders. Yeah. So, so far, as I said, I, I'm looking at the data, but we have very unique VUSs, which are, you know, just seen in this, in this population. So I, I, we have 78 WGS results back and, uh, you know, 28 or so are diagnostic, some have VUSs. So the numbers are still small, but I'm hopeful that we may find a pattern uh, with more studies uh, being completed. Um, yeah, that's all I can say for now about this. Um, but yeah, something that we will be looking at in the future for sure. Yeah, I think that's one of the sort of unique and outstanding questions when you try to say justify you know doing these these studies you always want to um it, that's one of the things is that oh we, we learn something new or something different we identify you know variants that we wouldn't otherwise have been able to see or carriers for this kind of stuff so i'd be really keen to see how that comes through uh right. in the, the as the sequencing continues okay um, we are running up on time, but if there are any sort of last minute questions or comments that people had that were burning. Someone told me to always count 13 seconds. Great. Uh, well, if not, um, it's just left for me really to thank Dr. Lani for a fantastic talk. Um, thank everybody for attending and for uh, engaging in this. Uh, you know, I think that this is a space that, you know, as we expand our diagnostic capabilities, that we have to be mindful about how we fill these spaces and that we're not creating additional health disparities in the work that we're doing. Um, so thank you once again to everyone um, and have a good evening. Thank you all.